This is Ian Thomas, who's the chairman of Thomas Consultants. Ian is the uh, uh, chairman of Thomas Consultants, as I mentioned. Uh, he's a, a firm specialising in the planning and development of large-scale retail projects around the world. And as a development strategist, he takes pride in bricks and mortar outcomes, resulting from planning programs, and with Thomas Consultants measuring their success based on the mandate of making projects work. So consequently, pragmatic research and collaboration with the world's leading architects has produced many award-winning centres. So we're very fortunate to be joined today by Ian Thomas, so please join me in welcoming Ian to the lectern. Good afternoon. It is uh, always a pleasure to have this opportunity to, uh, uh, for me to be in Melbourne. I've been working uh, on and off here for over 30 years and, uh, you know, when Richard talked about uh, how Melbourne, uh, in certain ways, seems to be uh, uh, behind the eight ball when it comes to, say, suburban mixed-use, high-density development, uh, I've always seen Melbourne as a bellwether city. And uh, I live in Vancouver, even though I was born in Sydney. And I've lived over in North America for 40 years. And you all know that Vancouver and uh, Melbourne all vie each year for the world's most livable city. And uh, I come to Melbourne and I'm always amazed how leading edge it is in, in so many ways. And uh, so I find that, um, you know, like 10 years ago I used to lecture at the... Harvard Graduate School of Design on regional town centre development. And um, I wasn't really thinking so much of Melbourne then, but everyone around the world now uh, is talking about town centre development and how you want your own project, not just to be a town centre, but to be the centre of town. And the catalyst uh, for all of that is really um, transit... Um, um, uh, systems uh, that uh, uh, are, uh, are planned and at certain um, station stops you get this massive um, town centre development. And I say that because uh, in my presentation, and we've been doing this for 40 years in many cities around the world, uh, it really takes off like wildfire. And, and if you, you get it right, it's just amazing how you can change uh, perceptions so fast and people will embrace uh, suburban town centre development with a catalyst of, of a light rail system or, or, a, or a transit system. So what I want to do is talk to you uh, briefly to show you that there are precedents galore. That, uh, Melbourne is seriously thinking of this uh, new transit light rail system and the examples I'm going to show you, um, hopefully, if you don't have religion at the uh, end of my uh, prepared remarks, uh, I don't think I've done a very good job. Um, a lot of it, you know, stems because I've come from a retail background, and you always wanted uh, your centre to be, as I said, the centre of town. You know, it was a natural social gathering meeting place. And so if you look at history... You know, 150 years ago, it was the church, and 100 years ago, it was the, the railroad station. 50 years ago, the mall started, and now we, we've come uh, full circle. If you go to Paris, I'm sure many of you do, many think that's the world's most beautiful city, uh, the Saint, uh, Saint uh, Lazar station, and uh, it, it was just a single-purpose uh, development, and only... Ten years ago, did it decide to go to mixed use by adding a major retail component, and now as we speak, they're adding more hotels and, and office. And you go to Moscow, and I don't know if any of you have been there, but you know when they started their uh, transit system 100 years, um, 80 years ago, what their points of difference was that they wanted each station to have its uh, own iconic design, which was really quite staggering. And... Uh, but now um, they've, they're developing these elevated um, light rail systems. Um, 
in, many of you, I'm sure, have been to Los Angeles and know how gridlocked it is almost 24-7. And uh, myself included, I didn't even know uh, when we were doing this research uh, that they actually had uh, a tram system. But when you see uh, this, this, this photo and you see uh, what a maze it is, no wonder um, uh, it failed and they went back to the automobile. However, um, in the last 50 years, there's been any number of cities, and I'll mention some of them as we go through this quickly, that have developed these very sophisticated light rail systems. And a lot of them have come through research and good planning by the manufacturers like Siemens and Bombardier. And, but I think one of the, the most interesting common threads that I think in all of this is how quickly everyone realizes the high density opportunity, whether it's residential, whether it's office, whether it's hotels, quite apart from the retail. I then want to, uh, and it's not that living in Canada, but I think uh, uh, Canada is a fantastic example, uh, particularly in Toronto and, Mon and in Vancouver, of how uh, uh, systems, if they're planned correctly, can really take off. Now I just want to sh talk to you briefly about some of the, our other projects and just to show you what's happening. Here's a project in Germany we've worked on. Um, and again, uh, great mixed use. Um, uh, this is both heavy rail and light, light rail. Very successful project, brand new. Several, several of you have probably been to Birmingham. They've got that famous mixed use project there called the Bull Ring. And interestingly enough, um, ten years ago, four of the biggest developers in the UK all got together to build this massive mixed-use project at the Boring Station. It's interesting in the US how finally, finally, they're starting to get religion with light rail. Um, here's a project that we've been working on near Disneyland uh, called the Platinum Triangle. I don't think you can really read that very well, but it's a mammoth uh, project that will happen over time and it will embrace, um, uh, you know, ultimately um, about half a million square feet of retail. Uh, uh, I can't even read this. Uh, three and a half thousand residential units, hotel. It's got the whole genre. And this is the point I'm, I'm really going to be wanting you to, to uh, try to understand. A lot of this is not done sequentially. You don't just start with a residential or with an office. They tend to happen all together. They all reinforce one another. It's synergy at its best. It's a tapestry that can be woven together very successfully. Um, another project, if many of you have been to uh, Hong Kong, you've probably seen one of the best mixed-use projects in the world, which is uh, Pacific Place. It's a developer there called Squire. They are literally replicating that in its entirety in Miami. And, uh, and you can again see uh, they are building this in a, in a single phase. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's the full meal. It's got all the elements all being built, be it the residential, the retail, the office, the convention center. Uh, it's interesting how each city tends to refer to its own LRTs uh, in a different way. In Miami, they call it the Metro Mover. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to Reston Town Center. That's been the poster child for a lot of suburban uh, mixed-use development. And they were promised, uh, a bit like um, Canary Wharf, uh, you know, a rapid transit connection link, a spur line to them. Uh, well, only now is Reston getting theirs, but it will be the cream on the cake. Another leading edge city is Portland, and I know a lot of planners, and I know a lot of you are in the audience, are, um, use Portland as an example of a very good mixed use. Now, uh, what they've opted for, and this is like some of the slides Richard was showing, what's already happening in Melbourne, they've opted more for medium density, whereas most of the projects that we work on tend to be very high density. But nevertheless, it's a great example of um, how you can get these big projects off the ground. I mentioned earlier about Toronto. Uh, Toronto's had their light rail system, their subway system, for um, uh, over 50 years. And one of their uh, uh, first 
um, projects, I'll go to this, was um, this one, and I worked on it, it was one of my first assignments in Canada, was um, what was called Shepherd Center. And you can see the architecture here is 40 years old. But again, this was built by Rank City Wall, the British developer, and again, it was built as a single phase, incorporating this 39-story residential tower, two office buildings, and, and uh, about half a million square feet of, of, um, of uh, retail. Um, Toronto is like Vancouver, where the city uh, fathers have designated not every stop for major um, uh, res uh, um, town center development, but at key, key places, um, they have earmarked it, and then they put in place uh, incentives to make sure it, it gets developed. And this is one, this is, and all of these are um, probably 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometers from the downtown. So this isn't on the edge or midtown. This is um, classic suburban. Uh, this is, uh, here's another one uh, uh, called, uh, yeah, that's, that's Shepherd Center. Here's another one in uh, Richmond Hill. Again, this is about 40 kilometers north of uh, downtown and where they've taken both heavy rail, light rail, and, and uh, the bus loop all connected into a general precinct area. And then, as a result, then they're able to uh, create a project, which is this is well underway, called uh, Langstaff. And uh, in its completed form, it'll be... Um, uh, um, so I'm looking at the, well, it's about 4,000 uh, 4, residential units, about 3 million square feet of office, million square feet of uh, residential. Another interesting project is uh, the Scarborough Town Centre. And, uh, and, and th this is kind of happening in reverse, and this is often what you find. They started off with a big regional mall in the 70s, you know, a million and a half square foot mall, successful f literally from day one, right next to a super freeway, the, the, uh, the 401, you know, a 10 lane super highway. And then they started to put the residential around it. And then about uh, uh, 10 years ago, the city, uh, then more office, um, tenants wanted to be out, and this is the, another, another interesting phenomenon uh, where we've got a very successful mall. You can you put office tenants next to it. There's the natural synergy there because people in suburban areas don't have to at lunchtime jump into their cars and di drive 10 minutes just to go to a restaurant. So suddenly uh, Scarborough became um, successful literally overnight. And so when they wanted to develop a spur line from the main line, uh, they, instead of um, doing what was done previously, going into, um, say, greenfield sites, they went right to the heart of where the action already was. So um, the light rail system now has become an in incredible part of, um, of, of the Scarborough Town Centre. Now to uh, Vancouver, and there's probably no better example, I think, in the world of how uh, light rail has uh, taken off like wildfire. I'd only uh, uh, commenced 30 years ago, in 1986, when Vancouver had their, their World's Fair. And as a showcase for the World's Fair, they built this very sophisticated, elevated, driverless light rail system. And... Uh, 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 Vancouver is a bit like Sydney. It, it's uh, because of its topography uh, and it's very hilly and, and the water orientation, uh, being able to move around um, quickly is uh, next to impossible. So uh, the, the, when they built the, uh, the light rail, uh, it was like a demonstration project, again, by Bombardier, that other Canadian company. But because of its success, um, they now have um, any number of projects that have been uh, built. Uh, so this is uh, now the current uh, uh, light rail system they have in Vancouver, and you can see how large it's become literally overnight. I now want to take um, a few examples in the suburban area of this uh, LRT routing system. 
of, of certain projects, including Station Square, Surrey Central, in New Westminster, Marine Gateway, and Brentwood. All of these are very high density projects. They, uh, the residential towers typically would be 30 to 40 stories, and in some cases up to 60 stories, a bit like what's happened in Sydney at the Chatswood station. Uh, this is one, again, we were heavily involved in this. This is Metro, uh, uh, sorry, Metro Town. Um, uh, uh, and part of Metro Town is called Station Square. So these are existing uh, um, elements of the project. There's the LRT line. Uh, here's, here's another very interesting project. This is probably 40 kilometers from downtown. And uh, the commute times are, you know, an hour and a half, two hours from this area in rush hour. Um, so 10 years ago, uh, the city fathers decided that they would incentivize a developer at the terminus station of the then line for the LRT to create a town center development. And they built this 40, 50 story um, office tower, which also included a university, also included convention facilities, museums, libraries. So it, it, it was not only just residential and office and hotels, but it had those other institutional qualities. And it became an instant success. And that's, um, that's it um, on the right, the, the initial projects. And that's the, the, uh, the footprint plan for it in its completion. Uh, another project, and you can see the, uh, the train, uh, and, and I, I was always amazed. We, we worked on, on this, and, and this was one of those forgotten areas. It was old, dilapidated, the world had passed it by, and, uh, but it was right on the, on, near the water, the, the Fraser River, and uh, they put the station stop here, and then the enterprising developers uh, in Vancouver saw what was happening in other towns, in, in other transit stations. So a group of them got together and they built this. And again, this all happened in about a, a six year period. Um, this is a brand new project. This doesn't um, show that well, it looks a bit institutional, but this is just opening as we speak. And again, it's a 40 story tower. Uh, and then the retail is all um, happening. Um, it will be going forward very soon. Um, this is this project I mentioned where some of the residential towers are up to 60 stories. This is the Brentwood Town Centre. Again, it wasn't a fail shopping centre, but again, uh, it was occupy, uh, occupying about 30 acres of land. It was a single purpose, very um, uninspiring centre. And so uh, a local developer uh, bought it and came up with this um, town centre plan the city had already announced a spur line with a major uh, station stop um, at Brentwood. And um, this is what we're now seeing. They, uh, a bit like the same thing with uh, all the Chinese buying in Vancouver. So these three 60-story towers, so it's 180 floors, uh, literally sold off a plan within about three months. And that's well underway. There it is again. Um, and so here's, you know, a, a, a line that everybody is talking about today. Trained theme development sites is the hot button out in Vancouver. It just connects everybody. So you don't have to worry about your car, which is a huge selling factor. And in fact, in many of these projects, um, you know, the Urban Land Institute had a uh, convention in Vancouver about 18, almost two years ago now. And uh, they talked about... Um, how these, this rapid transit line has become so efficient that uh, all the parking stalls that they've built in all these residential towers, no one was using them. And they kept um, reducing it down. And there's now certain projects, and they could be 30 or 40 stories in height, there is no parking um, provided. So uh, again, that brings costs way down. It's much more affordable. So, uh, so the question now is, what does the future hold? And, uh, you know, I think Todd, transit-oriented development, is truly the wave of the future. It is sustainable, obviously. It is so uh, environmentally responsible. Communities are now starting to happen all around these uh, Todd developments. 
So not only are you there to live, but you can also work, shop, and play right in your own community. The Vancouver public transit system is governed by an organization called TransLink. And they have prepared what I think is a great summary. They refer to it as the six Ds of how you make transit-oriented development work. Number one is major destinations and city centers are lined up in direct corridors, making them easy to, to serve efficiently by transit. Point number two with the D, walking distance uh, to frequent transit is minimized by creating an urban structure of well-connected streets. Point number three, design. People-friendly design includes safe, comfortable, and direct pedestrian and cycling access. Point number four, density. Incorporate higher levels of residential and employment density. Point number five for the Ds, rich diversity of land use and housing types. And the last point, number six, demand. Demand management measures that discourage unnecessary automobile trips. There's been an enormous amount uh, done in Canada about the advantages of getting people out of their automobiles and into the, uh, into, and into the transit system. Uh, and it is available, there's a website that you can look at and, and uh, to verify all these uh, statistics. But they claim that if you live within a Todd development that you can save an average of $10,000 a year, you will have more money in your genes that can be spent in the community. Another thing they have found because in a lot of cases, that, you know, that traditional uh, suburban development of single family detached homes is a thing of the past. And so everyone now is tending to move more to these uh, transit oriented high density projects. And because it's the flavor of the month, re residential values in particular are increasing um, as much as 50% higher than traditional single uh, um, detached housing. And then, of course, the other thing, and this is what LA is now only just realizing, that you, you, you can never build enough highways. You're going to ha always have gridlock. So that's why they are now starting to develop their own rapid transit systems. And so, again, that's why transit costs can come way down, uh, or, or in infrastructure can, costs can come way down. My final point is, um, what, are the, what are the lessons that we have learned you know, over the years? And um, a lot of them are obviously um, uh, um, 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 would be commonsensical, but, but, but nevertheless, they need to be emphasized. And the first thing is get the land uses right. Um, promote density. The more body heat you can create on a 24-7 basis, clearly the more successful it's going to be. The community... Um, the, the wayfinding, how you get the connections, how you go from precinct to precinct becomes really, really important. It's like following the yellow brick road. Um, the, um, the more compact you can make it, the more you can tease people to go from one to the other. And then there's that livability aspect. Um, again, if you've got, particularly if you've got a hotel and office component, how do you actually manage effectively the demands for those separate uses? The next point is make the destination a place. You know, if it's a project that has a beginning and an end, but a place uh, will go in perpetuity. So um, uh, and then I didn't mention point number four was um, Good urban design, um, a lot of these projects are iconic in their nature simply because they go 40, 50 stories. You can't have ordinary architecture. You want some iconic architecture which will be very aspirational in that community. And in so doing, that iconic architecture can galvanize enormous community pride. And the other final point is, surprisingly, is because you're now living in a concrete jungle, you do need green space, and there's a, an expression 
that we use today, um, public space is the new anchor. So you're going to have to develop a whole lot of very interesting public spaces you know, in this very dense environment in order to get the, the balance that you need for livability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.